So hello and welcome back. So the last thing that we have in this section of this in this text is basically the rates of change. And uh, it's a simple concept. Uh, there is nothing complicated about it. It's again the same concepts that we have talked about before, but again this this is again another way of thinking about basically the things that we have talked about before okay so about the rate of change about the rate of change now basically usually based usually what happens is that when you when you do a when you draw a two-dimensional coordinate system like this and usually you put the x-axis over here and the y-axis over here and you have basically some graph for example let's say you have this straight line over here so in this in this type of situation essentially what happens is that is that basically the value of the value of y for example, if you take this point over here, this becomes the value of y, and this becomes the value of x. So, essentially, you could call this y1, you could call this x1, for example. So, in this case, essentially, you can say that the value of the value y1 depends on, depends on basically, um, the value of the value of x1 right and well of course likewise you can take essentially this point over here then you would have y2 and then you would have for example x2 over here and so on and so forth right again basically the value y2 is going to depend on the value of x2 and so on and so forth so technically basically in this type of situation we say that basically we say that y is a function of x is a function of x and hopefully you, you understand what it means to say that y is a function of x um, basically when we talk about the function uh, essentially this axis over here this this x-axis represents essentially nothing but a set a set containing some elements this is a set x and this axis over here represents another set that you can call for example you can call y and inside this inside this set x you have all of your x's inside inside this set y you have all of your y's and if you call this function for example call it f then there is a um, there is essentially a relation uh, on these two sets uh, the relation you can call it f for example and you know that essentially one type of relation one one type of a relation is called a function so and then essentially what the function what the function does essentially is is that it it essentially does a mapping from your and this this set is called your domain and this set is called your codomain so there is a mapping from your domain to your codomain meaning that you can say that for example you have x1 x2 x3 and for example you have y1 y2 y3 and so on and so forth there is a mapping from x1 to y1 x2 to y2 and x3 to y3 and so on and so forth that's a function and of course since it's a function you know that it's not possible to it's not possible that x1 essentially is mapped to y1 also mapped to y2 it's it, it's then it's not going to be a function right meaning that if f of x1 is equal to y1 uh, and also f of x1 is equal to y2 and since y1 is not equal to y2 this is a, an impossible situation right so you, you you cannot do this 
you can say that for example you can say that basically x1 maps to y2 for example also x2 maps to y2 meaning that f of x2 is equal to basically y2 and f of basically x3 is also equal to y2 and that would be a valid function that uh, there is no problem with that but otherwise um, but otherwise basically a function is just simply a mapping from from a domain to a codomain and uh, the, the mapping is essentially done this way meaning that for example you can see that based on this rule uh, for which you can draw a graph um, x1 is mapped to y1 x2 is mapped to y2 and so on and so forth and that that is essentially a function and when we say that basically that y is a function of x that means that the value of y depends on the value of x meaning that for this value of x you have this value of y for this value of x you have this value of y and so on and so forth right now if basically if this is the case meaning that if y is a quantity that depends on another quantity if y is a quantity that that depends on another on another quantity And another quantity x so um, so then basically if y essentially is if y essentially is a quantity that depends on another quantity x and well what I mean by what I mean by this is essentially the situation as a, of a function exactly a function meaning that you have meaning that essentially in, in in simple words or essentially in um in mathematical terms essentially what i mean is that y is a function of x okay because y is a quantity that depends on another quantity doesn't have doesn't have much meaning i mean even even though i'm saying it i don't even i, I don't even know i don't even understand what i'm what i'm talking about myself because I'm I'm essentially um, quoting that from this text but what is meant essentially by this by this statement is that is that basically y is a is a function of x and then if you if you understand um, properly what what the, what the essentially the um, the concept of a function is then we have no problems then I understand what I'm saying and you understand what I what I, what I mean so then basically then f is a function of x or excuse me they, then y is a function of x y is a function of x and we write and we write we can say that basically y is equal to f of x so that means that essentially when we say y is equal to f of x that simply means that y is a function of x right this is usually not so clear in most mathematical mathematics textbooks essentially now you can you can think of this situation in in, in terms of basically a graph you can understand the situation much better or much more clearly suppose that you have basically the y-axis here and the x-axis here and suppose that you have a function for example which looks something like this you have this function over here and suppose that you have basically some x1 over here and you have some x2 over here right and well this is basically this function let's let's call this function for example f and so if this is the case then you can say that basically that the coordinates of this point call it p for example and this point call it q for example 
then the coordinates of this point would be x1 comma f of x1 right this is the coordinates of this point and the coordinates of this point would be basically x2 comma f of x2 x2 and and x2 and f of x2 so which essentially means that which essentially means that basically on this graph well it that it could mean many different things of course but this is essentially the point x1 this is um, basically this point essentially is has essentially these coordinates this is point x2 and 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 essentially then this point has these coordinates now i can draw a line between these two points like so and and this would be a secant line right this would be a secant line because it goes through the graph of the function in these two points i could also draw a, a, a line to the graph of this function which is supposed to be a tangent line something like this and this would be a tangent line this would be a tangent line at this point exactly at this point and of course well then you you would you would appreciate the fact that uh, basically that this that this distance over here you could call it basically x2 minus x1 and this distance over here this distance over here you could call it basically y2 or essentially you could call it f of x2 minus f of x1 right because the height over here is f of x2 and the height over here is f of x1 as a result this distance becomes f of x2 minus f of x1 right so in this situation in this situation over here um, if x changes from x1 to x2 meaning that on this graph basically if essentially if x changes changes from from x1 to x2 right then essentially the change in x then the change in x um, also which is also called which is also called basically the increment the increment of x is given by is given by so the, essentially the change in x or the increment in x would be given essentially by this distance which you can which you can call basically x2 minus x1 which you can call basically delta x right so delta x would be the, the would be, would essentially be the increment of x or at least we could define it that way there is no problem with that now as a result of basically incrementing x by delta x which as you can see essentially this is x1 <coughs> and i'm incrementing x1 by delta x so you can see that basically at x1 the essentially the output of the function is at f of x1 and when i increment x by delta x the output of the function becomes f of x2 which means that there is a corresponding basically change in y or in f of x essentially right so then the corresponding the corresponding change in in y the corresponding change in y is given by is given by basically you could you could call it f of x2 minus f of x1 as we have written over here 
f of x2 minus f of x1, which you can call, for example, delta y. So that means that this can be this can be represented as delta y, and this can be represented as delta x, right? Now you know that basically, you know that 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 basically that the slope of this secant line, that the line that goes through the point P and the point Q, is the amount of rise that you have over the amount of run that you have. The amount of rise is delta y. And the, the amount of run is delta x, right? So, so then you can, you can consider, you can consider the, the difference quotient. You can consider the difference quotient. The difference quotient delta y by delta x which is the same thing as f of x2 minus f of x1 over basically x2 minus x1, right? So you would appreciate the fact that, of course, it's very simple to see that well, this is um, this is essentially the this essentially delta y by, by delta x that we have um, um, that we consider here is the average rate of change of the function with respect to basically whatever whatever you have along the along the x axis what it means is that for example if this was the position of um, the position of a particle moving along a straight line and this was for example time then basically the the slope of this line essentially would be average velocity right the slope of the line would be average velocity um, which is essentially the average rate of change of position with respect to time right so which means that which means that basically that that this that this difference quotient which is delta y by delta x is called the average rate of change of y is called the average rate of change of y rate of change of y with respect to with respect to x over the interval over the interval x1 to x2 and 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 of course it can be interpreted as the as the as the slope of the secant line right and can be interpreted as and can be interpreted as the as the slope of the of the secant line right so then basically long story short delta y by delta x would be essentially the average rate of change of y with respect to x over this interval and it can it is of course it is of course the the the, the slope of the secant line we already understand that Now, um, now, what would you do? What would you do if you wanted to? What would you do if you wanted to find? So this was essentially the the average rate of change of y with respect to x over this interval, right? So what would you do if you wanted to find the instantaneous rate of change of the function at, for example, x one, right? Meaning that. Uh, and we already understand that basically that can be represented by essentially the slope of the tangent line at x1, which would be the slope of this line over here. So in order to, in order to basically, in order to, to find that, to find essentially the, the instantaneous rate of change at this point, 
what we would do is the following so we would essentially have our function over here something like this we would have essentially our function like this and then what 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 we would do is that we would say that okay so this is the point for example x1 and this is the point for example x2 and there is basically this line essentially going through the two points as well and the and the inst and this is the average rate of change so the slope of this line represents represents average rate of change average rate of change of y with respect to x right and this is y and this is x right moreover basically if i do a tangent over here something like this the slope of this tangent line the slope of this tangent line represents basically the instantaneous rate of rate of change rate of change of um, of y with respect to with respect to x um, so the slope of this line which is the slope of this tangent line um, represents essentially um, represents essentially the instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x right so and 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 basically we know essentially how to calculate the slope of this line which is essentially nothing but delta y by delta x that we know that we that we can calculate but then in order to um, this is delta y by delta x over the inner wall basically x1 to x2 right now in order to find the instantaneous velocity in instantaneous rate of change or essentially the slope of this line what i could do is that i could consider basically shorter intervals of x1 to x2 meaning that i could say that okay so i'm going to take instead of taking x1 and x2 as this large interval over here i'm going to make it a little bit smaller and i'm going to call now i'm going to call this x2 and now basically the line that goes through these two points i already know how to calculate the slope of this line based on delta y by delta x the same thing essentially is the exact same procedure and you can see that the slope of this line if i compare the slope of these two lines with the slope of this line over here the slope of this middle line over here is much closer to the slope of the tangent line which is what i want to calculate right and so essentially what i what i what i need to do is that i need to consider basically these shorter intervals of x1 to x2 by letting x2 approach x1 right and then basically again what i can do is that i could say that okay again i consider a shorter interval like the, like so and this becomes essentially called this this point x2 and then basically for example this becomes the secant line something like this and now you can see that the slope of this green line is much closer to uh, the the slope of the of the tangent line than the slope of any any of these two lines essentially right so i can i can make this interval meaning that i could essentially allow x2 to approach x1 and then basically calculate the same uh, the same quotient difference right or the same difference difference quotient calculate the same difference quotient over and over again and make this 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 uh, and make this interval smaller and smaller and smaller and as i do so the slope of these lines is getting closer and closer to the slope of this line and in this process i will be able to calculate the slope of this tangent line over here right
so that the so essentially if I call this basic the, the average the average rate of change the average rate of change then the limit of these average rates of change is called then as a based on based on what we discussed the limit of the limit of the limit of these average rates of change rates of change is basically called the instantaneous the instantaneous rate of change rate of change of y with respect to x which is which is the the slope of which is the slope of the of the tangent line the slope of the tangent line at x is equal to x1 right the slope of the tangent line at x is equal to x1 or essentially at this point basically which we call over here the point p right so this means that basically the instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x as a result we can say that the instantaneous the instantaneous rate of change rate of change of y with respect to with respect to x would be equal to the limit of delta y by delta x as delta x approaches 0 because as x2 essentially approaches to x1 or essentially over here as delta as x2 approaches to x1 this delta x is getting smaller and smaller meaning that as delta x approaches 0 then x2 is essentially approaching x1 right so we could say essentially that the limit of delta y by delta x as as delta x approaches 0 or basically since we said that basically delta y is the same thing as f of x2 minus f of x1 and since we said that delta x is the same thing as x2 minus x1 then we can write this as the limit of basic the f of x2 minus f of x1 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1 as x2 approaches x1 right and this is nothing but the but the derivative of your function at this point x1 you see over here at x this is the derivative of the function at x1 right so this would be so this essentially uh, this is the this is the derivative of derivative of f of f at x1 which is denoted by which is denoted by f prime of x1 right Okay, so now there is, um, now essentially what we talked about previously, um, what we talked about, pre what, what we talked about previously was that, was essentially we calculated something we called it, for example, f prime of a, and we, that was essentially the limit of basic the f of a plus h, for example, minus f of a over h as h approaches zero right and that was basically the instantaneous rate of change of the function at a meaning that if you have a function like this so if this is your function then basically if this is a and basically if this is a and f of a and this is f and then if this is for example the 
the instantaneous rate of change of your function, essentially the tangent to your function, this would give you essentially the derivative of your function at this point, which would be the slope of this line, of course, right? Um, so th this essentially you can, I mean, if you call this, for example, if you call this point, this point, if you call it x1, then the, then the exact same thing you can call it for example f of x1 f prime of x1 as well so it's it's essentially the same thing right so essentially what i mean to say is that whether you call this f prime of x1 or whether you call it f prime of x what this means is that essentially is that that this limit that this limit over here represents basically the slope of this line this is the slope of the of the tangent line of the tangent to the graph of to the graph of of f at a for example something like this right and basically over here recently we, we came to the conclusion that that basically that the limit of delta y by delta x as delta x approaches zero which is essentially in nature the same thing as the same limit over here is also the 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 instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x right at uh, at x1 the instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x at x1 which is denoted by f prime of x1 which means that basically we could say that which means that we could say that the which means that we could say that the instantaneous the instantaneous rate of change rate of change of of y with respect to x at x1 denoted by denoted by basically f prime of x1 or basically for example f prime of a uh, a or x1 so that the instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x at a or x1 denoted by f prime of x1 or f prime of a is essentially the same thing as is the same thing as as the as the slope of the tangent line the slope of the tangent line of the tangent to the graph of f to the graph of f at basically x1 or a essentially so what this means is that basically if you have a function over here for example if, if your function is something like this then if you call this this point a for example and so that then you have a point over here on the on the graph of the function then if this line essentially represents the tangent to the graph of the function at this point the and call this point for it call this line for example l1 then you could say that the slope of the slope of the slope of l1 is the and if you call this f for example and if, if, if this is the y-axis and the x-axis you can say that the slope of l1 is the instantaneous is the instantaneous rate of change the instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x at x1 at a essentially and also the same thing as and also the same thing as um, 
the instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x is the same thing as the slope of this tangent line. So the slope of L1 is the instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x at a, right? And the reason why basically, um, the reason essentially why the the slope of the line can be interpreted as the instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x is essentially um, that that that's something that you need to understand okay the reason for that is that as I mentioned before now if you consider your function for example something like this the same function that we have been working with so far suppose that for example this point over here is x1 this point over here is x2 and this is f of x1 and this is for example f of x2 and then there is a secant line and then there is a secant line and then there is a tangent line over here right so th that is essentially that's that's all about that now you know that basically that the slope of the secant line is the average rate of change in the in the inner wall x1 to x2 and the slope of this tangent line is the instantaneous rate of change of uh, the instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x at x1 right and you can see that basically um, And, and using essentially the, the exact same the exact same procedure what I could do is, is that I could draw a tangent line over here and this and the slope of this line then would represent the, the instantaneous rate of change at x2 and the slope of this green line would represent the instantaneous rate of change of the function at x1 right and you can forget about this 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 red line this for now is not really that important now you can see that basically that the um, that that basically that the slope of that the slope of this that the slope of this green line is much higher than the slope of this 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 other line over here right now a higher slope what it means is basically a higher uh, essentially a higher slope is a higher rate of change meaning that for example you can imagine that you have a uh, you can imagine that you have a line with with this slope and you have a line with this slope right now in the case of this line over here uh, let me do this in a in a coordinate system so that you can see them properly I need to bring in my coordinate system. Okay, so now in order to show you the slope of the line, I'm going to draw two lines. For example, the line y is equal to x, meaning that the slope of the line is equal to 1. And for example, y is equal to 5x, which means that the slope of the line is equal to 5, right? And so you can see that, of course, this line over here is the, I mean, the slope of this line is five times the slope of this line, right? In the case of this, this, this red line over here, you can see that if I, in the case of this red line over here, you can see that if I move essentially one unit in the horizontal positive direction, then the, essentially I will have to move one unit in the positive vertical direction to get to essentially to this point for example on the graph of the function which means that essentially if you increment x by one unit you will increment what you will you will increment your y essentially by one unit as well right but then in the case of this blue line over here whose slope is five times the slope of the red line if I move one unit in the in the positive x direction I will have to move five units in the 
five units in the positive y direction in order to get to, to another point on the on the graph of the function which means that basically the change in the case of the blue line the change in in y is five times the change in x right because five is basically five times one but in the case of the red line the change in y is only one one times essentially the change in in x meaning that one times one is equal to one but then five times one is equal to five over here so that means that higher the slope of the line higher is the higher is essentially is, is the rate of change and uh, for example if this was the case with for example um, if this axis was represented for example a position of of an object moving along a straight road and this was time then basically for example in the case of the red line after essentially every second basically the position would be changing only one meter for example right but then in the case of the blue line every essentially after every second of time essentially going by the position would be changing essentially by five meters which means that this is a higher rate of change uh, compared essentially to the to the to the red line over here so this is essentially the basic idea of calculus to be understood right so so that so that means that basically then um, uh, a um, if you if you draw for example a graph the graph of a function for example y is equal to x squared um, you can see that the instantaneous rate of change at this point which is one comma one would be y minus y minus one is equal to two times x minus one right so this this the, the slope of this line would represent the, the instantaneous rate of change of this function at this point meaning that at this point essentially the slope of this line is two right which means that for every horizontal for every change for every essentially unit of change in the horizontal direction the essentially the change in the vertical direction would be twice that would be two two units of vertical change right but then basically at this point which is for example two comma four the line tangent to the graph of the function would be for example y minus y minus four is equal to for example four times four times for example x minus two which means that basically you can see that the slope of this line is four over here which is and this essentially represents this represents essentially the rate the instantaneous rate of change of the function at this point at this point the slope of the line is only two but then at this point essentially the function has gotten a little bit faster twice as fast and uh, so at this point essentially then with since the the slope of the line is four with every um with every inc every one unit of increment in x you would have four units of increment in y so that means that the rate of change is two times as fast essentially right compared to compared to this point basically comparing these two points together right so um and basically at this point over here which would be for example when y is equal to zero at this point over here the tangent to the graph of the function would be basically this red line over here and the slope of this line is zero right the slope of this line is zero meaning that exactly at this point which is zero comma zero uh, the function is just simply not changing the simple there, there is no change in the function right so that means that basically the tangents that you draw to the graph of the function at every point essentially the 
the flatter that the line gets essentially there is less change less instantaneous change in the function and the steeper that the line gets as you can see over here for example this line is a little bit steep this line is, is a little bit steeper and so on and so forth the steeper that the line gets that means that the rate of change is increasing and increasing and increasing okay so um, so now if you if you connect basically if you connect essentially all of these ideas to basically to a function which represents basically displacement and uh, displacement versus time or position versus time so um, suppose that you have a function for example something like this this is the y-axis this is the x-axis and this is for example your function and let's say that this is s is equal to f of let's say that this is t and and this is for example s and uh, and basically this is uh, f of t for example meaning that the function can be represented by s is equal to f of t for example <coughs> suppose that this is position suppose that this is position and this is time right and this describes essentially the 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 the, the motion of a, of a of a particle along a straight line for example <clears throat> then basically if i call this if i call this point a then at this point you could draw essentially a tangent to the graph of the function like so for example and the slope of this line the slope would be equal to f prime of a essentially right the f the, the derivative of the function at the point a which would be the slope of this line right And this is the instantaneous rate of change of displacement. This would be the instantaneous the instantaneous rate of change <coughs> rate of change of displacement displacement with respect to time with respect to time meaning that meaning that basically f prime of a would actually represent the instantaneous velocity would represent the instantaneous velocity of basically of the particle of the particle at time t is equal to a essentially right now you know that basically in physics at least uh, velocity is basically is a is a physical quantity that has a direction meaning that you could have positive velocity you could have negative velocity right and so since basically and there is another physical quantity called speed right and speed is the same as um, um, speed essentially is the same as velocity unless that it doesn't have any direction it just has the magnitude which means that basically um, the speed in this case would be you could you could you could consider this as the as the as the absolute value of the of the of the velocity or the absolute value of f prime of a essentially so the abs when you take the absolute value of velocity you would come across a speed essentially now i do understand that um, well in this essentially in this text the material sometimes doesn't flow very naturally okay and mm, in the moment it's not possible for me to change the <clears throat> to change essentially the order of material in this text because I'm not this is essentially the first time that I'm going through this text myself I'm not that familiar with this text 
if if I if I knew the text better I would change the order of things I know that things are not flowing very naturally but essentially that's the best that we can do for now and um, well this text is considered essentially the best text that you can find on cal on basic calculus on introductory calculus so if I if in the future if I when I finish this book hopefully if I ever come back to this text I will change the order of the material in this text completely so that the material flows more naturally otherwise right now I'm just I mean I do understand that I'm I keep saying the same thing over and over again and there is the, and the material is not flowing very uh, and not at least in the best way that it could so but there is no way to change that for now okay now at any rate now there is two problems over here not problems but examples in the next video we will talk about these examples and then we will get to the exercises so i'll see you in the next video and thank you